to chapter 8 first. So I'm just going to read uh, and sp- speak, okay? It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. So he had been a judge and he had a circuit that he traveled, if you remember last time, and now his sons are judges. Now the name of his first son born was Joel, and the name of his second was Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba, but his sons not walked in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgments. So they were bad. They weren't quite Hophni and Phineas, but they were bad. They abused their position. They went after filthy lucre. They perverted justice in Israel and took bribes. Then, the elder, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came unto Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, you're old and your sons do not walk your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now this has been, this has been building and this was the tipping point. This, this obsession with Israel that goes all the way back to Judges. We want a king. There is no king in Israel, they kept saying. Even though there was a king, God was king. Okay, but they didn't like the kingdom of God. They wanted a king. And here, here they literally said, we want a king like all the rest of the nations. So this is a worldly des- desire. Is everything, is everything all right? The lights aren't turned on? On my, on my thing? Yep. Oh, that's all right. I can see. I'm, I'm, I'm reading supernaturally. Praise the Lord. Every once in a while it kicks in. All right. <clears throat> so they say we want a king. And this has this become an idolatrous obsession. And it, it's much more than that as, as it'll be explained here. It, it says the, the thing, verse uh, 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. See, this, this displeased Samuel on many levels. This is a rejection of Samuel, because he was the last judge. They don't want him anymore. Of course, Samuel, no doubt, felt terrible because his sons became a stumbling block. And that became the pretext, the tipping point for this desire for a king. But also, he could see something even worse in that, in that they said specifically, we want a king like all the nations. Now, this goes all the way back to Gideon, okay? Amen. And he takes it to God, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. See, Samuel could see under these politics flat out rejection of God, complete rejection of God. They have not rejected you, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They did not want that. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. So he said this is in continuity with everything they've done since the Exodus. They were always fighting God, they're always resisting God, they're always rejecting God. They rejected Moses, and they rejected certain of the judges. Now they're rejecting Samuel. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. He says, listen to them, give them what they want, but tell them by the Spirit what it means to have a king like the other nations. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this shall be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And he'll set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. It's called the military industrial complex. He will take your daughters to be confectionaries, to be cooks, to be bakers. He will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. That's right, that's called patronage. And he will take the tenth of your seed. He'll take a tithe of you. If you get rid of God, then you say, we don't have to tithe. Yes, you'll tithe. You'll tell you to do more than tithing. Does the U.S. government demand a tithe of us? 
If only. <laughs> he'll take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards, and he'll give them to his officers and to his servants. And he'll take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses, and he'll put them to his work. He'll take the tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Very similar to Judges, only this time now it's not pagan uh, oppression. Their own kings will oppress them, is what he's saying. You want a king? Basically the speech is what he'll take <laughs> for himself. Because he got a big, build a big apparatus and a big royal retinue. And he'll have a court, no doubt. Every day he'll have to put out food for the whole court. Where's that food going to come from? Your fields, your houses. Where are those servants serving the pastries going to come from? Your daughters. Where are those people working on chariots and horses? Your sons. Where are those armies that he's going to have? They'll come from you. He'll take everything. It's uh, what the king will take for self-aggrandizement. Now, don't get me wrong. God did intend for them to have a king. But in his plan, they were supposed to mature to a certain point to where they could get a king after his heart. But they demanded a king like the nations. They asked for it. And he says, all your fruits will go to the king. The fruit of your body, the fruit of your fields, the fruit of your flocks, everything will go to the king. You'll tithe to him. Okay, because when you have a king like the nations, it becomes idolatrous. Now we've got the same thing now with the big government debate. Government is everything. Our government, which art in Washington, give us today our daily bread and give us our health care. This is idolatry. The Bible is a very political book. But this is what they wanted. And they'd much rather have this than to live by faith. It's, they'd rather have this. Why? Because they're worldly. They want to be like the world. Uh, I see this in Africa. They love the big ruler. The people could be poverty stricken, starving to death, and living on the very edge of subsistence. But they're proud of their big daddy ruler. Some big fat guy in a general's uniform with driving a BMW and all his staff drives a BMW. And that's the big man. They love it. It's kind of idolatry because it's a vicarious divinity. Okay, that king's me. He represents me or what I'd like. And God says, you'll cry out one day. You'll cry out to one day because of your king, which you, you will have chosen you, and the Lord will not listen to you in that day. Nevertheless, the people, predictably, refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but we want a king over us. This is the oldest, and, and it's also not only ancient, it's the future of Israel. They would have a king. In fact, all the way up to the Gospels. What is the pinnacle, the climax of the Gospel of John? Where Pontius Pilate looks at the high priest of Israel and says, You want me to kill your king? And the high priest, the representative of the nation of Israel, stands there in the name of God and tells the Roman secular authority, We have no king but Caesar. The rejection of the kingship of God. That's when Israel died. But this is the seed, the foreshadowing of it. We want a king. That we also, why? Why do you want a king? Verse 20, that we may also be like other nations and that our king may judge us and go out in front of us and fight our battles. Now they didn't have to look back in their history very far to see what happens when God fights your battles. God fought their battles. Remember that Ebenezer? God fought the battle. And they didn't lose one drop of blood. No, we want someone we can see. We want a bigger than life personality. We want someone to go out in front of us like a rep. We've got prestige too. We're in with the big movers and shakers too. 
And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and make them a king. Be careful what you ask for. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go every man to his city. He just had to get, accede to it. Okay, this is the transition. They want a king, give him a king, make him a king. Now chapter 9 is how they found that king. There was a man of Benjamin. Now this is funny too. Okay, all the tribes of Israel, there's so many tribes that are so glorious. So many tribes that were valiant in battle. So many tribes that were like prophesied like uh, Judah. Uh, Ephraim, so, so populous, numerous. And yet of all the 12 tribes, he picks a man from Benjamin. God does. Now, if you remember, this is the end of the Judges. What happened at the very end of Judges? Benjamin was so backslidden that they replayed the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it caused a civil war in Israel. It was so bloody that by the time it was done, Benjamin was almost wiped out. If you really go back over Judges again, everything he says about Benjamin is usually negative. The false prophet that set up his own tent, a Benjamite. The, the people that uh, raped the concubines, Benjamites. Uh, the, the, the people that did the Civil War, Benjamites. The whole tribe, when they said, this, these guys, these men of Sodom, they destroyed and ravished my, my concubine, Benjamin, Benjamin stood alongside them. Wouldn't give them up. Took the side of evil. But by, by the time they're done, there's, all, there's only 600 men of Benjamin left. And yet when God wants to give the first king to Israel, what tribes he choose? Benjamin. A man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. In other words, he's a wealthy man, an influential man. He had a son whose name was Saul. Saul, Shaul. It means ask for. Remember? They're asking for a king. So God chooses a man named asked for. A choice young man and goodly. In other words, prime specimen. A handsome man. If there's anyone qualified by looks, it'd be him. Head and shoulders above all the rest of the people. He says... There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. He's talking about his looks. He from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. The only problem is that his, he couldn't find his father's ass. Okay. The asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. Now asses are a royal, a royal beast. The, the word is actually she-asses. Kings ride on she-asses in the Bible. Even Jesus rode into Jerusalem on an ass. But it was a cult. And uh, so he's a shepherd of she-asses of his father, but he can't find them. And Kish, his father, said to Saul, his son, Take now one of your servants with you, and arise and go seek the asses. Well, now, this man, Saul's in his 40s at this point. But he's obedient to his father, so this is a very good thing. His father sends him out to look for those lost asses, and he's gone for three days looking. He doesn't give up and go, go home. He, he's going all over the place looking. He passed through Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found him not. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, and there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuth, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let's go home, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God. The servant knew. Saul didn't, which tells you that Saul wasn't particularly religious. Because I would think Samuel would be the most uh, well-known person in the whole nation. But the servant knew that Samuel lived in Zuf. And he said, uh, there's a man of God in this city. Uh, and he's an honorable man. All that he saith comes surely to pass. Now let's go there. Perventure, he could show us our way that we should go. Let's go find the man of God, Samuel. 
And let's ask him if the Lord would show him where our father's asses are. Men said Saul to his servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent and our vessels is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. And then he explains the custom. Verse 9, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spoke, Come and let us go to the seer. That's what prophets were called, seers, because they could see what no one else could see. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said then, let's go. So they went into the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the seer here? I want, you, I want to point out a couple of things about this. Number one, they're, going, they're always going up from here on. Everything's up, 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 up. They go by a well and there's two ladies by the well. That's biblical imagery. A woman at the well. When Jacob, uh, when uh, Abraham wanted a bride for his son Isaac, the servant found a woman at the well. When Moses wanted to get, uh, was come out of Egypt, this woman at the well that he helped, he ended up marrying one. Usually the woman at the well, you find a woman at the well, you get married. Well, Saul doesn't realize it. But he's about to get married to all of Israel. For the king is like the visible husband to the bride of Jehovah. So the women are at the well. He says, hey, hey you know, is the seer here? He has no idea what's going on. And they answered him and said, he is, behold, he's before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city. There's a sacrifice for the people today in the high place. As soon as you be come into the city, you'll straightway find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he's, he does bless the sacrifice. And afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time you'll find him. So the ladies almost talk as though they, knew, they were expecting him. Yes, go, he's in the city. They won't, they won't eat until you get there. What? Yeah, there's a feast, and you're the main, the main guest. Not the main course, the main guest. And they're all waiting for you. How do these women know this? Everything in this story from here on is just full of the Holy Spirit. And they said, but they won't eat until he blesses the sacrifice. Now they're talking about something that would happen just in a few minutes. But they're also prophetically talking about something that will come to pass in Saul's life that will set the tone for everything from there on. You don't rush. You wait until the sacrifice is blessed. This would be one of the key conditions for Saul's reign to stay within the bounds, to not rush or overstep what God called him to. And these women who Saul had never seen before, they're like angels at the tomb. They're speaking to him prophetically. So they went up, it's all up. They went up into the city. And when they were coming to the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. So they go up to the city, and then they got to go in the center of the city. It's the highest place in the city. So they climbed the hill. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I'll send you a man out of the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hands of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. Now a lot of times, because we think we know the whole story of Saul, that we look at Saul dimly like he's being set up and like it's a failure from the start. But no, you got to look at Saul more like an Adam. It's a new start and he will be tested. And it's the first king of Israel. How's he going to do? 
And the Lord's intention was to use him to save God's people out of the hand of the Philistines. This is the beginning of the end of the Philistine crisis. Verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spoke to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. By the way, Saul has no idea. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. <laughs> Can you show me the, where the seer's house is? He's talking to the seer. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place. For you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I'll let you go. And I'll tell you all that is in your heart. He's always going up. Everything is upward. As for thine asses that were lost three days ago, don't set your mind on them. They're found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? What? What does Israel want? You, Saul, you. And Saul answered and said, am I not a Benjamite? You see, it's just unthinkable. What? We're the most despised tribe in Israel. We're known for perversion. We almost wiped out the whole nation. A civil war broke out that killed all but 600 of us. We're just outstanding in our perversion, in our fallenness, in our de decadence. He said, you kidding me? I'm a Benjamite. Of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, why then do you speak so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chief place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 people. He walked into a room, there's 30 people around a table, but the head of the table. So he goes up again, seated at the head of the table. They're hungry, but they can't eat. There's a sacrifice made, but they can't start. Why? The main guest hasn't arrived. Now he's here. <laughs> Salt's going, I was just looking for my father's asses. What? And Samuel said unto the cook, bring the portion which I gave thee, which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder. That's the part that Eli's son stole from people worshiping because it's the important part, the part that's reserved for the priest. But Samuel said, Samuel's the priest. But Samuel said to the chef, take the shoulder and put it in front of this big man here. This is Eli, or um, Samuel, basically adopting Saul. It's kind of like a son. You'll be a son. The relationship was supposed to be prophet-king. The king was to rely on the prophet and obey him like a son would obey his father, just like he obeyed Kish, looking for the ass. And so he sets the prime portion, the shoulder, the portion that would have been reserved for him as the priest. He sets it before Saul, and Samuel said, Behold that which is left, set it before thee and eat, for unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. When they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. So they go up again on top of a house to have communion. See, the Lord is elevating this man. The Lord is lifting him up to use him. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servants pass on before us. And he passed on. But you stand still a while, that I may show you the word of God. We sent a servant before him. And he stood there in front of the prophet Samuel. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be a captain over his inheritance? He's anointing him as king of Israel. 
When you're departed from me today, then you shall find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto thee, The asses which you went out to seek are found, and lo, thy father have left this care of the asses. And now he sorrows for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then you shall go on forward from there, and you shall come to the plain of Tabor. And there shall meet thee three men going up to God at Bethel, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when you are come there to the city that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabre and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. What it literally says is, the Spirit of the Lord shall hit you. The Spirit of the Lord shall rush upon you, and you shall prophesy with them, and you will be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are coming to thee that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with you. Well, these are the three signs that were given to Saul. The first one is someone's going to meet you on the way back and tell you. Your asses are found. Now your father's warning, mourning over you. Well, what's that sign say? You are being relieved of all your former responsibilities. It's three days that you've been out. What happens after three days of resurrection? You're starting a brand new life. The old life with its old responsibilities to your father, that's over. Now you will commence the work of being a king. You will soon be, quote, found. And take the royal position. Your asses are found. But the part about your father mourns for you. Well, it's, what they're saying there is, in a sense, he's lost his son. His son died, but now he's a, a, new, a new person. You're not, you're not supposed to obey Kish anymore. Now you're Samuel's son, basically, the prophet's son, son, a son of God. Kings were called sons of God, eventually, in uh, Psalms. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's a coronation psalm. You got a new father. Your father is mourning you because it's over. The old relationship's over. Son, go out and find those asses that wandered away. That's done. Now you're going to obey God. Now you're going to follow God. And if you will, you will be blessed in your kingship. And then the second sign is three men with three kids, three loaves, and, three, and, and wine. Uh, going up to God at Bethel. Bethel is where they worshiped. And the three kids, well, that's sacrifice. Sacrifices are for God. So you can't take that. That belongs, you can't, a king can't take a person's worship or sacrifice to God. See, this is, this is one of the things that I think is a really spiritual thing in our own law code. The 501c3 says that they can't tax worship. That's right, that, that's, that's, that's true. Government doesn't have authority in that area. So he doesn't, get, he doesn't get the kids. But they will give him two loaves. Now the, 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 the bread and the wine is part of the worship too. And by giving him two loaves, they're saying, look, you're in a new class now. You get to partake of, of these sacred things. Okay. But they didn't give him three loaves. They gave him two. In other words, only take, only take as much as God apportions you. Well, this will be a theme of Saul's kingship. Don't step over the line. Two loaves, not three. And they didn't give him wine. Why? Well, even in life, you start the day, you go to work, you need bread. When your work's done, or when there's a holiday, then you can have wine. Wine is for when it's done, not when it starts. So that would be the second sign that God gave Saul. God's now giving you some kind of a priestly share of the bread. But only his allotted portion. And then the third sign. You're going to run into a group of prophets. 
See, this is really kind of neat. The Israel of Judges was apostate, constantly idolatrous. What few believers are there are like minor. When God did, did have to raise up a judge, he often had to raise up people who didn't even know God, introduce himself and bring him back to God. But this is 30 years after uh, the ministry of Samuel. And you have pockets of people everywhere that are devout. And what they call some of the school of prophets, it meant these are, these are usually uh, people that just sold out, lived in company together. They lived their life to worship, to intercede, to do God's will, to keep the word alive, to preserve it. Okay. They were ecstatic. In other words, they were spirit-filled. They were dynamic. They had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says, you're going to run into a group of prophets, and as soon as you do, uh, they'll, they'll be playing the psaltery, the tabre, the pipes, the harp. And as they play, they'll start prophesying. And when you run into this group, the Spirit will come on you, and you'll prophesy too. So every one of these signs came to pass. He goes down the road, someone says, by the way, your father's now mourning for you. The, the asses are back. They've been back for three days. Your father's wondering what happened to you. First sign. Second sign, three people on their way to worship God. One guy's got three kids. They're going to be whole offering sacrifices to God. One has three loaves and one has wine. All of this is to participate in a ritual of worship. But the guy with the three loaves looks at Saul and gives him two. And Saul just takes it. It'd almost be like a daze, wouldn't it? Your life has changed so radically. And it's just such a powerful shift of everything. And then the third one. Remember, Saul didn't even know Samuel lived in Zoph. Samuel would be the most important, famous religious figure other than Samson in the whole land. But Saul was that irreligious. But as soon as he came into the company of people full of the Holy Spirit, he himself began to prophesy, which could mean a lot of things. He may burst out into praise. He could burst out in prophetic utterance. He could burst out into exhortation, whatever the Spirit had. And it says... He became a new man. Saul became a new man. And then what it says is that they said when he ran into the prophets. Let's see, where is that? Oh yeah, six. The Spirit of the Lord will come on you and you'll prophesy to them and you'll be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are coming to thee that you do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shall you tarry till I come to thee and show thee what you shall do. Now that verse right there is really, really important. But it doesn't come to play till chapter 13. It's a huge verse. What's it doing there? Well, this is his inauguration as king. And this underscores one of the primary conditions of whether or not his reign is going to be successful. Don't overstep God's boundaries. Don't be impatient, impulsive, and step over the line sit there and wait for God. It's supposed to be a prophet-king relationship. Not just a king. Prophet-king. You're supposed to listen to Samuel like a father. But that doesn't come, come into play until chapter 13. It was so when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass in that one day. <laughs> I love this. When they came there to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass when all they that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesies among the prophets, that the people said one to another, what is this that is coming to the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? What are they saying? Is this Kish's son? 
Or whose son is he? Where is Saul got religion? Saul's one of them. <laughs> and one of the same place answered and said, well, Who's their father? Because they just said, Is this the son of Kish? No, who's their father? Who is their father? Who is the father of these sons of prophets? And who is the new father of Saul? Samuel. In what sense is Samuel their father? 30 years of his judging Israel had sparked religious revival. And there were true pockets of true believers everywhere. Schools of the prophets, people turning to God, people being filled with the Holy Spirit. Who's the father of all that? Samuel. So it actually became a proverb. Therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? Him? <laughs> and it raises an important question about Saul. Will Saul remain a faithful son of Samuel? Or is he going to be another Hophni and Phinehas? Go his own way. Will he remain among the prophets? Will he stay spiritual? Will he fear God? Will he be filled with the Holy Ghost? Will Israel always be able to say, he Saul's among the prophets? It remains to be seen. When he made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. Now let me finish this chapter. When Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Where did you go? He said, To seek the asses. And when we, we saw that there were nowhere, we came to Samuel. Man, he's being coy. His uncle, which by the way, could have been Abner who emerges later in the story. Hey, where were you? He doesn't tell him anything about the kingdom. Now, what does this remind you of? Jesus healing people in the gospels and saying, don't tell anybody. Keep it between you and I till the time. So he's got the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't time to tell his uncle, I've just been anointed king. No, it's going to come out in a far more dramatic fashion. And so it goes on. And verse 15, Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said to you. What did Samuel say to you? He knew he talked to Samuel. And Saul said to him, He told us plainly that the asses were found. But of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spoke, mm -mm. He didn't tell him. That was probably the wisdom of God. Now Samuel called all the people together unto the Lord at Mizpah. And said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. And you have this day rejected your God who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said unto him, No, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. A very similar process to when Achan was caught with his sin. They all filed by the high priest, the heads of the tribes. And when Benjamin had come by, the um, Urimum Thummim lit up. And by God's divination, they, they found, no, oh, it's Benjamin. And then all the clans of Benjamin come along. And when it was the right clan, the Urimum Thummim lit up. And then when all the, the sub-families went by, when it was the right family, Urimum Thummim lit up. And they finally, they reduced the whole nation down to one man. It's Saul. Where's Saul? Everyone's waiting for the new king. Where's Saul? A seven-foot man is hiding back among the baggage because he's so shy. Okay, he don't want to be there. Look what it says. Uh, verse 22, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come there. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hid himself among the stuff. Oh, the high priest had to find out from the Urim and Thummim even where Saul was hiding. <laughs> And they ran and fetched him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. 
And Samuel said to all the people, You see him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there's none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. They get real excited. Because everything physically you'd want in a king is in him. How about a guy seven foot tall going out before you in a battle? How about a big strapping guy? God save the king. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, which we already talked about. He wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel said, all the people now, every man to his own house. And Saul also went home to Gibeon. What do you do after you get anointed king? I don't know. What do you do next? He went home to Gibeon. But there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. In God's mercy, he gave him what we'd call a cat. Cabinet. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. But he held his peace. That's a good place to stop, right here. My God. Thank you for this sacred record. Thank you that your word is timeless and speaks to every generation, and especially this generation, perhaps more than ever. And thank you for the applications of these sacred truths. And thank you that men don't know what they need. They know what they want, but they don't know what they need. But you've given us a Mashiach, a Messiah, despised and rejected by the sons of Belial, but accepted by anyone whose heart you touched. You let us see, Lord, in this one, in whom there's no beauty that we should desire him, that he's the king you chose. He's the anointed one that you've set over the kingdom. You said, this is my beloved son, in him I'm well pleased. And I have set my king on the holy hill of Zion. And Lord, thus shall it be. Please teach us the lessons that we're supposed to get out of these books. Breathe your breath of life on these teachings. And not only for those here, but for the many out on Facebook and YouTube and wherever else. I bless you that you made the world so much smaller these days. Let us work while it's light. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.